When it comes to drawing in sketchbooks, as opposed to drawing on a drafting table, we're drawing freehand. We're not using triangles and straight edges to create perfectly crisp lines. We're using a free hand to do that. That takes practice, certainly, to get to a point where you can start to create lines that are reasonably straight, but they don't ever, in a sketchbook, have to be perfectly straight. The other thing that we're doing when we're working in a sketchbook is we're taking advantage of the character of the paper, which is heavier, uh, has a texture to it, and is very different than trace paper. We're taking advantage of that to add color more than anything, uh, but really just to take a more multimedia approach to what we're doing. Another thing that we're doing with a sketchbook, very typically, is we're adding notes. These notes could have to do with a lot of different things. It might be descriptive of what it is we're drawing, or it might be something that we're experiencing while we're doing the drawing. Because very often what we're doing with sketchbooks is we're taking them with us to a variety of places and using them as a mobile place to draw and capture information that information oftentimes has to do with ideas, thoughts, all kinds of things that might end up as notes. Sketchbooks, therefore, are largely personal. They're the kind of thing that we use to capture uh, ideas about space, design, whatever it is, uh, and put those into one place that we end up keeping and referring to as the years go by and we need to inform ourselves about design. So your personal sketchbook will always have some kind of characteristic that is uniquely you. But one of the things that we want to do with the assignments in this class that relate to the sketchbook is build skills, a variety of skills that will allow you to then start speaking with your unique voice as you go about collecting different kinds of information, dealing with architecture, interior design, landscape, etc. Since we're talking about plans most specifically right now, that's the assignment that you're going to be working on, I do want to say something about scale in a sketchbook. So when I discussed earlier measurement techniques, using a tape measure, that was important because we were talking about drafted drawings and the specific measurements of drafted drawings are part and parcel to what we're trying to do. They need to be measured drawings. In the sketchbook that's less important and yet relative proportions are still important. You don't just draw in a sketchbook without caring what the dimensions of the thing are that you might be trying to draw but you don't need to be quite so precise of measuring. So how do we reconcile those two things? How do we go about capturing things in the sketchbook, especially if they are plans, that are reasonably accurate? One way is to simply pace off the distances, the big distances of buildings, and then record those. So what I mean by pacing is literally just walking from one place to another. You don't have to do anything unusual or special. It's just walking at your regular pace from point A to point B and counting your steps. Since your steps will almost always be relatively uniform if you're walking at a normal pace, you can start to use your steps as a general, rough, reasonable, way of measuring buildings and places outside, even interior spaces like this. So to measure this room, I'm just putting my heel right against the wall here and I'm just going to walk naturally one, two, three, four, five, six. This room is six paces long. Uh, and it doesn't matter how many feet and inches my paces are. All I'm worried about is the number six right now. And if I pace everything off like that, then those units of my paces take the place of feet and inches or meters and centimeters. They are my paces. With that information, I can translate the spaces around me 
in a reasonably accurate way to my sketchbook page. I'll walk you through one quick example of what I mean by that, but uh, these are books that I, I enjoy using. They are moleskin. They're called A4 uh, watercolor books. The paper's really nice. I like the way that they are, you know, horizontally arranged um, because I can do big horizontal stuff. I could also do some pretty sizable vertical stuff in these books. Anyway, um, I've filled a number of these books and this technique that I'm going to show you is something that has helped me make plans in particular and a few other kinds of drawings in these books. So this is uh, one of the books that I worked in, oh, a number of years ago, 2014 through 2016. I'm usually working in a lot of different kinds of sketchbooks. Uh, the kind that you uh, are working with is one that I work in quite often as well, and I've filled a number of these. Um, and I usually try and mark on the, the corner, or excuse me, the binding, what the date is so that I can have them on my shelf and, and uh, refer to them. This one, um, it has uh, you know a fair amount of work actually from right here on campus. There is Forney Hall right there. Um, that is the uh, Food Science Building, right? But there's also uh, a number of works in here from places like Rome where I bring students uh, typically each year. And this page spread here includes a exterior perspective, uh, an interior perspective, some historic notes, and a plan of this piazza and its associated church uh, that is directly adjacent to the building where we've had our studio for the Rome program for quite a number of years. And what I'd like to show is how I arrived at this plan, how these things sort of, you know, how, how I measured it and transferred it here without walking around with a tape measure and measuring everything, but merely by pacing things off. In exactly the same way that we created these drawings by starting with a rough freehand drawing and then adding numbers to it, that's precisely what I do in my sketchbook as well. And, you know, I do that where I can. Maybe I do it on a separate piece of paper, but in this case I did it just inside, on the inside cover of this sketchbook. You can see the sketchbook's been around, the binding is kind of falling apart a little bit, but uh, I hope you can really, you know, see this clearly or clearly enough. What I did is a, a rough sketch of the the church footprint, the plan, and then the piazza, and that required me walking around and looking at these things and making the drawing, just like I showed before. And then I just paced around and counted my paces in different places here, you know, 26, 15, 7, 22, 27, okay? So I have all of that information. The next step is to, you know, open to the page that I'm going to work on and think about where is the drawing going to go on the page and how big can the drawing be on the page? So I did have to consider what were the overall dimensions. If I'm going to go all the way from here, all the way to there, I had to kind of add up a number of these measurements and figure out what the overall was. And I think, pretty sure I did that right here. I was doing some, you know, just basic addition to figure out what that was. And therefore, how big I wanted it to be on the page. In this case, I knew that I was going to do an exterior drawing here and an interior drawing here, and so I had a certain amount of space to work with kind of in the center of this page spread, right, you know, across what we call the gutter of the page. So I, I knew that it had to fit here, and so I had to make some decisions about, well, how long is that going to be? I have the numbers and I have the size. So what I had to do was create a temporary scale. And that's just, I had a spare piece of paper, uh, and along the edge of this spare piece of paper, I created this scale. I did that by laying this down and thinking about, you know, how long this wanted to be. I think I, I had to give myself something like 200 paces. And so the entire length of this would represent 200, 
I, I don't think I folded it, maybe I did fold it in half, but to get to 100, you could just take this, I did, because I'm starting to bend it and you can see where I folded it. I folded it in half like this and just gave myself a little bit of a mark and said, okay, that's where 100 is because that's half of 200. I did the same thing you can see right there for 50. Uh, in other words, I folded from here to there in half, got 50, and then I did the same thing from there to there to get 25, and then I just sort of estimated 25 divided by 5 is 5, and so that gave me a scale. It's not a, you know, a literal architectural scale. It's a scale that is based on the size of the thing that I'm, I've paced off and the size of the drawing in my book. It's unifying those two things through the use of a temporary scale. It's really, you know, after you do it once or twice, it's actually really easy to do this on the fly, on location. Uh, and what it allows you to do is capture a plan with a reasonable amount of accuracy. Again, without having to go around with a tape measure and measure everything very, very carefully. One other thing I'll emphasize here is uh, when you're working with a sketchbook, the best strategy is to do all of this or as much of it as possible on site. So you're in a place, you're recording visual notes in that place so that you can keep making observations if you need to as you're building the drawing. Things like color, if we're using colored pencils or watercolor, maybe that stuff can be added later uh, at home or in the studio. But when you're first taking notes, when you're first laying out the drawing and building the drawing, it's always best to do that on location. That's one of the advantages of a portable sketchbook like this. And you don't need uh, all of your drafting tools. So you really can do this with just, you know, a pencil and a pen on location. In laying things out, you can go directly to ink if you like. Uh, if you're a little bit reluctant to do that, a good strategy is just to use a pencil. Uh, this is a relatively hard lead. This is 5H, uh, but you can use a, a, whatever the pencils are that you have in your kit. Just draw with a light hand if you're going to come back later and firm up those lines with ink. So I'll just draw a partial plan here very lightly. Again, freehand. I'm just giving myself, I'm making this up basically, uh, giving myself some guidelines for the walls, much as I did earlier when I was drafting. Maybe you'll notice one of the things that I just did to keep these lines reasonably straight is I sort of anchored my hand against the edge of the book. If I do that and hold my pencil in position and just drag my hand along the edge of the book, that's going to give me a really nice straight line. I can turn my book this way. I can do that however uh, it feels comfortable. But one of the goals is to make things reasonably straight. When I have enough information kind of laid out, then I can come back and uh, take a couple of pens. Usually what I do is work with a thin one and a reasonably thick one. So a thin one is going to give me a reasonably thin line and then a slightly larger one is going to give me a bigger line. And just those two line weights are really probably all I'm going to need for doing most of these kinds of drawings. I don't think I would need a, a medium line necessarily. Or if I did, I could just take the thin one and kind of beef up that line a little bit to give it a bit more thickness. So I might go through like I've done here and kind of go one line weight at a time. And I'm just drawing the same space here, my office. And when it comes time to draw a thicker line, I just kind of go through and do that for all of these thicker lines. And now I've got a really basic plan of my office here. I kind of goofed here. This wall actually continues, but for now, that's okay.
Once again, a sketchbook is a place to start experimenting with different kinds of media for adding color, or if I wanted to maybe pocher these walls. If I was going to pocher the walls, uh, I want to do that in a consistent way with a thin line and add what we would call a hatch pattern. I want these lines to stay fairly consistent in terms of their distance from one another and the angle. And a good strategy is just to make it a simple 45 degree angle. And you can go through and do that if you like, if you'd like to, you know, make it more clear what is being cut through in the plan. If I wanted to add color, uh, you do have a, a, a number of colored pencils in your kit. These are the three most basic ones, I would say. We've got True Blue, Magenta, and Canary Yellow. And with these three, we could combine them to create really any number of colors. Once again, the best strategy for that is consistency. Rather than just sort of coloring randomly, we want to be consistent about it. And I usually try to work again in sort of a 45 degree angle and kind of build up the tone. If I wanted to make that green, I could start to add another layer here. In this case, the canary yellow. And that starts to give me a green. If I wanted it to be more purple, I'm going to add red to the blue, or magenta. And those colors start to blend on the page. That's one of the nice things about colored pencil. But probably the more important issue, again, is consistency. So if I wanted to maybe start to represent, I'm not going to draw all of this, but represent the fact that in my office I've got a wood floor. I might do a light layer of red. A light layer of yellow. And believe it or not, I would probably also add a very light layer of blue. And that's going to give me something in the range of a sort of reddish orange, brownish. Uh, I certainly could choose just a simple brown color to make that brown tone on the page. But if we look somewhat closely at this, you'll see that the color that's being blended is kind of a more lively color, it's more interesting, whereas this color is a bit more flat. And those are just different choices that you can make about how you're going to go about adding color, at least using colored pencils. Watercolor is a little bit different. I don't want to get too down in the, uh, the weeds about it right now. I just want to show a really basic way of putting what we would call uh, a flat wash on the page. One of the advantages of this is that when you develop a technique for it, when you practice it a little bit, using watercolor to add color to a drawing can be very, very fast. And it also gives kind of a nice transparent uh, wash of color on the page. So to do this, I'm just going to get my brush wet here and uh, put a bit of water on my palette and then come here and pick a color, get it a little bit wet, add it to this water here and then with the brush fully loaded I'm going to start painting this on the page. I will keep the page tilted in this direction because once I start getting this on the page, you'll notice that there's a bead of water that gathers there. And really what I'm trying to do is barely touch the page and move that bead of water. And every time the brush starts kind of running out of water, I go and get more of that same wash and I just keep that moving down the page. When I've painted the area that I want to paint, 
I'm going to snap my brush. <laughs> Whoops, I just did it there on my page. But really what I'm trying to do is get as much of that water out of my brush as I can. So I come back here and lift this extra water at the bottom of the wash. And when I've done that, I leave this alone. The reason being, if I started brushing all kinds of stuff back in here, what happens is the water color starts to get kind of splotchy and uneven and it stops being so nice and clean and transparent. So I really want to leave that until it is perfectly dry before I might add another layer of watercolor over the top of part of it or work around it in any way. So let's say I wanted to use watercolor instead of this hatch pattern to show poche here or to just emphasize that these are where the walls are. Um, I can do the same thing. I'll just use this same color. Might mix up a little bit more. Make it a little bit richer. And again, with my brush fully loaded, I'm going to come in here and just start filling this area with a bead of water. I'm not really brushing the page. I'm moving the bead of water with the tip of the brush. And I'm tilting the brush, or excuse me, I'm tilting the book so that gravity is going to pull that wash down or keep that bead of water at the front of the wash so it doesn't creep back up in there. And now you can start to see how quick watercolor can be. If I'm just moving that, occasionally I need to reload my brush. I'm still tipping this, now I'm tipping it kind of off to the right. And all I'm really doing is moving that bead of water across the page. When I get to the end of the area that I'm painting, once again, I want to sort of snap out the brush and then use it to pick up the extra water at the end so that it's all even, okay? And once again, I let that dry. Don't worry too much about, you know, splatters and that kind of thing because once again, one of the things we're doing here is experimenting with media, learning how to use these tools. And so there's going to be a certain amount of messiness and consistency as you're just learning how to do this. If you want to start getting into uh, what we call graded washes, which is where a wash would go from one value to another, this is how that is done. You would start again with a wash like this give myself a bit more pigment there and I'm going to start a wash and at some point snap out my brush a bit come back and get a bit more water and then continue the wash do that again And as I'm going, I'm just increasing the amount of water in the wash. And then I pick up the extra at the end. And now I've gone from a relatively, you know, thicker wash or more saturated to a less saturated wash. The same can be done with colors. So if I wanted to start with this color, for example, and let's say I want to add some blue to that. Come and get some blue. And continue the wash. And you'll see that it changes somewhat gradually from 
that yellow wash to a more blue wash. Whoops, I grabbed a lot of watercolor there. But I can kind of just move that and then take up the excess and let it dry. I really do want to emphasize that point of moving a wash across the page in one direction or working your way around something and then pulling that excess water off the page and letting it dry. That is such an important thing, especially when you're first starting watercolor. It, it, it allows you to paint very quickly um, and the results are better. We end up with a nice clean sort of, think of it as stained glass. Think of the paper as the light source and if the wash is nice and clean, it's going to shine light through that almost like stained glass. Whereas if I really kept messing with this and working with it and painting and pushing down on the page with the brush, it ends up getting very kind of splotchy and uneven. When I'm talking about snapping out the brush, I was trying to do that on camera so you could see it, but it's not the case that I usually do it like this. I really try and snap it like that. I give myself some, some effort, right? And that pulls water and pigment out of the brush. And if I do that regularly before I go back into my water reservoir, I'll keep my water nice and clean. Anytime you have a brush that has a lot of pigment in it, you don't want to just stick it back into your water reservoir. That will make the water very dirty and cloudy and then you won't be able to get nice clean washes. So anytime I want to pull up excess water from the page or anytime I want to go and get some fresh water to add to my palette, I always snap that brush out. Obviously you have to be careful when you're doing this because you don't want to splatter people around you. Uh, if the floor where you're working doesn't want to get water color splattered on it, you might take a big sheet of plastic and lay that down. Outside, it's obviously not a problem. That's where I do most of my watercolor work is outdoors, so I don't have to worry about it. But in here, I do have a, a piece of plastic down here that I will occasionally lay out across the floor, and I can just snap my brush out no problem, and it keeps my water clean. It allows me to pull up excess water from the page. It's a, it's a really good way of working. When I've got the drawing worked out and colored and everything I'm gonna do to it, uh, or even before then, I might start thinking about where am I going to put text. And in doing text, if it's a title, I might uh, make those letters reasonably large. If it is just ordinary text, I might make those letters a bit smaller. What I'm doing here is giving myself some guidelines. Again, I'm not using a straight edge for this, but I am being careful about it. Hopefully you can see those guidelines reasonably well. And uh, I might even come in here, I've done this a number of times, where I'll rough out the text uh, in pencil because I might want that text to fit in a certain place. And so before I put ink on the page, I might just kind of say, well, uh, how big can this be to say Matt's office? And I'm just using a light pencil line to do that. And if that's where I want it to be, great. If it's not, I can erase it and try it you know, differently, wider, thinner. And then uh, I would probably come back here and just trace over that. I tend to use for titles all capital letters and you know printing does take some practice. There are good examples in your textbook of lettering. Uh, I do encourage you to be creative with it but at the same time one of the things we're trying to do here is develop skills to communicate clearly and it's not just about the drawings it's also about the text so again titles might be larger 
and uh, regular text might be smaller and I might also use a heavier line for the larger letters and a thinner line for the smaller letters so regular. and I've always been in the habit of putting a date on whatever it is I'm drawing uh, sometimes you add other information as necessary but at least you know starting to note things up what it is you're drawing where it is etc so that's going to do it for now i realize there's a lot more to talk about here in terms of how to work with a sketchbook but what i'm trying to do is just give you some basic pointers to get you off to the races to get started here um, do ask questions in the comments below or in class and i will see you next time